Good morning. Good to see everyone. So we see some people we know have been away for different reasons during this week. And there's somebody new to welcome to church this morning, isn't that right, Robin? Yeah. And Graham looks like a very, very proud, honourable grandfather. <laughs> It's lovely to see everybody this morning. So it's communion service as well this morning. Um, as I often do, I've got a Bible verse to read just to get us thinking about the theme for this morning and we're going to sing in just a moment. So that is taken from Matthew 20. It's in some of the Gospels as well. And Jesus says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We're going to particularly come back to that verse as we reach our communion, which we'll have at the end of the service today. Thanks, Tom. So, hopefully, the bags are out. I know sometimes we forget. The collection this morning is just for church, so if you've come prepared, that's great. If you want to bank transfer, let me know and all those things, but during our first song we'll have the collection that just is for the church. And our first song, we've got double Graham Kendrick this morning, we're going to sing Meekness and Majesty. So I'm going to jump down to the piano and we'll have the introduction, Buff and Anne will lead us in the singing, but of course it's for all of us to join in.
Loving Heavenly Father, first of all, we do want to thank you for our Saviour, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to die on that cross for us, and later on we will be remembering that, particularly in our communion time. We thank you for him, we thank you for his great love, his humility, but we thank you that the one who humbled himself is now the highly exalted one at your right hand. We thank you for the offering we've been able to take, we thank you for our church, your goodness and your blessings that you provide for us, and pray that you will continue to do that, even today in this service we pray that you will speak to our hearts and that you will help us to hear your voice. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Prayer time. So I'm going to mention two, and then we'll do the normal looking around of hands. Well, that's wrong. I think I might need to mention three, actually. Let's see if I can remember them all. I'll start, I'll start with Jill. And I know Jill would, would, would say this herself anyway, but Jill, of course, has been away for nearly, nearly a whole week with, 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 with Marion. You know, the funeral was on Thursday. Obviously, a sad time, but a blessed time as well. And Jill has been greatly encouraged, and Marion, they do want to thank everyone who's been praying for them. And it's lovely to see Jill back and know that things have, have gone well. Um, you might have noticed Anne sitting, well, not sitting on her own because she's sitting next to Chris, but not sitting with Mick. So, Mick's not very well, he's got a migraine, Mick's got the clinic for, for his foot coming up as well. So we just need to pray for Mick that he would know God's peace and that he would be feeling well, ready to go and have his chance. We've got a migraine today, so we need to pray for Mick. And also Jackie isn't here today. So of course sometimes on a midweek or two do we see Harold and Mavis sometimes as well still. So particularly we need to pray for Mavis. She's fallen down the stairs, she's broken her wrist and her ankle and she's in the Derby Royal. Now, how is it exhausted? That's not surprising, is it? And Jackie's got a sick bug, or has had a sick bug as well. That's why she's not out herself today. So, quite a lot to pray for, particularly for Mavis, but the rest of the family as well. So, don't think that means you can't know how to that, but there's three already. So, my lovely wife first. My friend Ellen has made it out of the hospital. Um, had her fancy scan to find out where her white blood cells are clustering, but she's not had the results of it. Can we pray that she takes it easy because we just hope she's not well, and that they quickly do whatever it is they need to do with their fancy scan, find out what the matter is, um, and that God might mercifully make it something that's treatable, fixable, and will go away fast. Looking left and looking right, looking left and jib breathe. Can we continue to pray for kids club? Yes. It has recommenced. Yes. And, and also the older kids club. Good. <coughs> well, let's pray then. Then Father, we thank you again that we can come into your presence. We thank you for your great care for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, of the reminder that as you came to serve and carry our burdens and our sorrows, Peter reminds us lovingly to cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. And Lord Jesus, you know the things that are on our hearts before we even bring them, the words on our lips, the things we are able to express and the things that we don't really know how to pray for. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who helps us and brings our prayers with you before the Father's throne. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for helping Jill through the last week and Marion, of course, and the family as well. We thank you for hearing the news that, although obviously it is a sad and a difficult time, but you have been known, your presence and comfort has been felt, and that as well as the sadness, as your word reminds us, we're not to sorrow as those who have no hope but we thank you for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus and how they have felt that through this week. And we pray that you'll continue with them now as we know you will as the funeral is done and life has its changes and the sorrows continue. We just pray that you, you will continue to bless them. Father, we thank you for each other. We thank you for Mick and for Anne. And we miss Mick and we pray particularly that you will grant him your peace, your 
felt presence. We know you were with him. We pray that he would experience your presence. And that as he goes for more consultation on his on his foot that causes him pain. We pray that you would overall in that too that he might have your peace, a peace that passes understanding, and that he may be able to be cared for and get the treatment that he needs. Buff has mentioned um, Ellen again, and we just pray for her. We thank you that we've been able to pray for her as a church, and we do ask now that as she's home, she would continue her recovery, the infection wouldn't return, and they would know how to finalise this treatment so that there is a lasting growing health and, and, a, and a lasting clearance of this infection. We want to pray for Howard and Mavis. We've known them over such a long time, and also Jackie and Nigel too. And we've heard this disturbing news today. A fall is, is bad enough as we get a little older anyway and comes with with different risks, but to fall down the stairs, of course, is far more serious. And Father, just pray for her, that her wounds, her bones will heal quickly, and that she will be patient as she needs to wait, that they will get the help that they need, and that Jackie will get better soon so that she can provide the help, of course, that she and Nigel want to provide. And we just lovingly commit them to you, and we ask for your help, your blessing, your healing upon them. We thank you for little Madeline with us this morning. What a blessing it is to think that you are caring for us as we get old and you've got such a future and good plans for us, whatever age we are, but particularly we think of that with somebody so young. We thank you for Robin, Ryan, for Madeline, for Nelly, and we just pray that you would greatly bless them as a family and help us to rejoice with them this morning. Uh, at this new new baby is for the first time as part of our church family. We pray that you will bless them. We think of our week ahead, particularly the children's work. We've started again, the kids are back at school. Some of the older ones with courses, exams and different things to do. We pray for our children who come to this church, where the kids club, where they're here on a Sunday. Pray for their families and we pray that you would bless them. Particularly those that are coming and learning about you and haven't yet put their faith in you, we pray for them and the people who bring them, that you would touch their hearts and open them to you, we ask. All these things we pray that you would provide your blessing in your wisdom and in your grace to your glory, we ask, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, mention three. We are going to carry on to notice, but I'm going to mention prayer number four. I could have prayed for it without mentioning it, but some of, not all of you will remember, and I'm particularly at this point just going to direct my eyes towards Ted. I went to Andy Ferguson last week. Andy used to come, of course. And he had a heart operation earlier in the year that didn't go very well. And I went into him and we were chatting for, for a little while. And he was going in for another pre-med and they were going to try again on this heart operation, potentially this weekend. And I said, would you like us to pray for you at church? And he seemed very happy to do that. So before I do anything else, I'm just going to keep my promise, and together we'll just pray for Andy. Let's just pray again. Father, we thank you for Andy. We remember lovely times with him and his wife before she passed on to be with you and his partner now. And we just pray that you would help him. We know he's struggling so much with his health and unable really to get around unless he's on his scooter. And life is so difficult. And this operation... We pray a serious operation on his heart. It didn't go well last time and they've come to the point they're ready to try again. We do pray that you would keep him safe through it, that you would help it to be more successful this time and that you would give him peace in his heart that he might know that you are with him and you are there for him and he can commit everything in his life now and for eternity to you. We pray that you'll bless him and help him and his family too as we ask it in Jesus' name. Okay, notices. Prayer meeting on Tuesday. I've got Jeff and Sandy's down. Nod number one, that's great. So that's uh, Jeff and Sandy's 7.45. Wednesday is midweek at two. Gentleman Jim Reeves, is that right? Yeah. So I've got a second nod from Jeff. <laughs> Not gonna say anything else about it. I'm sure it'll be interesting if you're one of those people who's free and able to come on a Wednesday, please consider coming and supporting that. 
Ruth asked us to pray for the children and the youth work, so Kids Club at 6.15, and everybody remembered the new time, the youth work for Rocksoy starting a little bit later now at 7.30, that's on Wednesday. Third time I'm going to look at Jeff, third night, and Jeff's leading the family service next Sunday. So Jeff's got a little bit of a busy week coming up. That's not the only notices. So, church down at Pine Lake, we've been putting this up quite some time, it's two weeks away. I know both of you can get in the list. So, today I will be contacting Jen, finalising details, giving provisional numbers. That doesn't mean you can't come if you've not said, but if you do want to come, really we want to know today. There's a bit of a window open because I don't know how many of the Kids Club families said they couldn't come and come last week. So there's a little bit of room for manoeuvre. But if you've not said you come in, it's sort of last chance today. Okay? And we'll give you all the details next week and organise transport if you've not got it and all the practical things we need to do. Rainbows. Coffee morning. So this is just an advance notice. Saturday the 21st of October. I haven't put the start time up, it's normally 10. We do, t we've been doing 10 to 10 o'clock, I thought so. So 10 o'clock, just to mark the card, coffee morning, it'll be our last fundraising event for Rainbows we do this year. And a chance to invite people along and enjoy some of the wonderful cakes. But I don't know if there's any gentlemen that make the cakes, it's often the ladies, but gentlemen can make cakes too, I expect. But all the lovely cakes that are provided, and for a good cause, of course. Okay. We're going to see again in just a minute. So you, we know we've been going through, or at least when I've been leaving, we're going through what I, what I do, the church has got intended. We're looking at how the Lord Jesus, head of church, how our church, we would love it to be honouring to him. And today we've reached the serving church. So I'm just going to put up my little diagram again. I know I've changed a few things, but we've looked at the teaching or the learning church, the loving church, the worshiping church, the praying church, and today, we're going to do the serving church, which of course fits so well with communion as well. So we're going to do this in two parts. We're going to look at the serving church first and then lead through into communion and think about our Lord Jesus. And I said we were going to do double Graham Kendrick. So you know which Graham Kendrick song we're going to see. It's probably his most well known, but it's such a perfect song to encapsulate what this is about. And also, although we're not having communion straight afterwards, of course, to lead into communion as well. Because Jesus was the servant who came and humbled himself and died on a cross for us in that amazing love and grace. So, again, after the introduction, stand and sing with Buff and Anne, and we're going to sing the servant.
First, a bit of a message about serving in context of what we've been doing, and then very much I want to leave enough time at the end to lead into communion, because it is ultimately, as we serve each other and our community, our Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest servant of all who we are serving. So there's a little tagline each week. So what's my little tagline for this week? The serving church. So we've looked at how we come to church to learn and be changed. We've looked at how we come to church to love and be loved. We've looked at how we come to church to worship together and to pray together. This week we want to think about how we come to church to serve and to accept being served. So I'll come to that a little bit later. That's what we're... Sorry Tom, is that me moving on? We're looking at. And also we're concentrating Acts, particularly Acts chapter 2. But here we are. That one's upside down. Here we are. I want to just quickly look at the serving church in Acts again. So following on from Acts 2.42, where the loving, teaching, worshipping and praying church comes from, this is how it follows on. It says the early church generously shared their possessions and homes. That's the tag. The Bible says all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So we see how the early church, these early believers, they had open hearts, they had open homes, and they had open possessions. They were generous in how they shared and served what they had. In the Bible study, we've been looking through Acts. So if we follow on and look at Acts 4, it's the prayer meeting this week, but next time it will be the Bible study. This is what it says in Acts 4. It says, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Don't just say much more about that, but if you come on to the Bible study in two weeks, we'll have more of a conversation, perhaps, on that topic. If you jump forward in Acts, there's a lovely lady called Lydia, who became a Christian when Paul and the missionaries went across from effectively Turkey into Macedonia and into Greece. And it says that Lydia opened up her home. She showed them hospitality. And that was the way that she served. So the early church generously shared their possessions and their homes. What else did they do? They served the needy. I'm not reading out the whole chapter, but if you're looking at Acts chapter 6, you learn a little bit more about the food distribution that the church did. Now, of course, in the last few years, and it's gone on year by year getting worse, hasn't it? People rely on food banks an awful lot. And lots of churches are involved with that to do food distribution. Here in the early church, it was the widows who were often, of course, had no income. And these widows in the church, they were particularly looked after. And this sharing generously was then becoming an organised food distribution for those widows. There's a lovely lady, if you go back and look in Acts chapter 9, a lady called Dorcas. And she actually died. But they were so concerned about this that they asked Peter to come and Dorcas was raised to life again. But what did she do? What was her role in that church? She made different clothes and other things for the needy people. Such a practical, loving thing to do. Dorcas, a servant of the church. And it's interesting, here's Dorcas helping the poor. We read in Acts chapter 4, there was no needy among them. Now, you know, you know us people who like to look at the Bible. There was no needy among them. Jesus said, you will always have the poor with you. But if you look at Acts 4, we shouldn't have needy people in our church. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be helping people outside. Dorcas is helping people outside. But we shouldn't have needy people inside because we should be looking after each other and then spreading this serving out. Yeah. We looked at this in Galatians 6, a verse I've mentioned before. Paul says we are to do good to all people. doesn't matter background, gender, race, class, whatever. We are to do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. 
And here they are first, making sure there's no need amongst themselves, and then flowing that out to their community. We may touch on that later. Something a little bit different about the serving church in Acts. So what we've mentioned so far is very much generosity sharing, practical serving. But there's a growing church in Antioch, and Barnabas doesn't feel he has the gifts and capabilities to serve that church. So what does he do? He goes and finds the Apostle Paul and brings him to Antioch so he can serve the church because he recognises he has the necessary gifts and abilities given by the Holy Spirit to serve the church. So serving the church is practical, but both involving spiritual gifts as well. And of course it's Paul and Barnabas then who are selected as the first evangelists to serve the church by going out further with the message. Which brings me neatly onto spiritual gifts. Yeah. Now we did a study on this with Max Lucado. Again, if you were there on the Tuesday night, you'll have enjoyed this and been challenged and encouraged by it. I'm not going to redo this study, but I've liked Max's list in his chapter on the Holy Spirit as the gift giver. It's the Holy Spirit who distributes the gifts with one Lord, one Spirit, with one purpose to glorify God. So on the next one, Tom. These were the things Max said as his headlines about the Holy Spirit giving gifts. He said, no gift list is complete. You've got these different gift lists in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and so on. And if you try and combine them together, you might get to 15 to 20 or so. But none of the lists are exhaustive. So there are many varied gifts that we have that the Holy Spirit gives. Not all gifts are given at conversion. Every believer has a gift or gifts. Some of them, the Holy Spirit will develop in you or give you later as you go through seasons. And this isn't just for young people. There's, I didn't look at which psalm it's from, but there's a lovely psalm, and it says about those of us who are getting a little older, that we're still able to bear fruit in our old age. Yeah? Some of the gifts rely a bit more physical strength and activity, so we might have those gifts when we're younger, but then the Holy Spirit may give us other things to do as we get a little older and are less able to get about, be active and those sort of things. But all of us still have a role to play. Spiritual gifts are exactly that, they're gifts. Spiritual gifts are not an index of spiritual maturity. Max is particularly thinking about the Corinthian church there. He said, no one is behind you in gift. But what a mess that church was. They weren't very mature. Spiritual gifts are nothing to brag about. They're gifts, they're given. Natural talents and spiritual gifts are not always identical. God can and often does use our natural abilities that he's woven into us, think Psalm 139, how he's planned and made us, and our passions, those things we're interested in. He often uses those things, and then with his Holy Spirit, that is a good channel. But sometimes you get a gift which is something that you may not naturally feel. I want to concentrate on the last one then. Spiritual gifts exist. Now this is obviously not the only way of describing this, but I like this. Spiritual gifts exist. One, to exalt Christ. Two, to edify the church. Three, to bless the needy. So if you go on, Tom. Every believer, each one of us who has come in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, every believer in him has spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit. We are to use these gifts to exalt Christ, to edify the church, and to bless the needy. Certainly within our church, and as I've said already, beyond the boundaries of our church. Now there's many good ways we could think about spiritual gifts, but that really appealed to me. Think about our church with all these little things around it, and you've seen the diagram enough now. Who's in the middle? Who's the head? Who's the centre? Ultimately, all of these messages I've been given are about our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going around, but we're always coming back to the middle all the time. Ultimately, whatever we do in serving each other, in serving our communities, whatever we do with the gifts God has given, first of all, it's to honour and glorify God. The great thing is we can honour and glorify God by encouraging each other and building each other up, helping each other with our needs, 
but also then taking a wider view to our neighbours, our friends, our colleagues, our community. So I like that. Exalt Christ, edify the church, bless the needy. So, keep it moving. I've modified what I said. The serving church, let's think about our church. We come to the church to serve and accept being served. That means all of us come to church to serve and accept being served. No one's excluded. All of us have something we can do for each other. All of us have things that maybe we need to accept from each other. So let me come to that word I've deliberately put in. I've underlined it on my page. We need to have the humility to serve each other. None of us are above serving each other. But we also need to have the humility to accept being served. None of us are above needing to be served. Yeah? All of us have something to contribute. All of us have something we need from each other. How many times? Those of you who've been in the church a long time will know there's Morris's verse again. But I'm going to make no apologies for it. I love that verse, and I particularly love it in the New Living Translation. Of course, other translations will put different perspectives on it. But this is what it says. He, Jesus, the head of the church, makes the whole body fit together perfectly. That's us. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's us. That's our church. So, in the next little bit, I want you to think about family service. Now, I'm conscious I've probably missed something. I'm not going to necessarily read through the whole thing. Just a Sunday service that we're hopefully enjoying and attending and participating in today. Think about what's gone on just to make this possible. The people who come and lock up, the people who set up the church, the people who are going to provide you with some, something to eat, some drink, that are going to tidy up. The work that goes in into putting a message together and delivering it. The IT, the sound, the music. Whatever it is. There's so much that goes on in here, in our little hour or two on a Sunday morning. All of that is serving. All of that's something that somewhere we can contribute to. And somewhere, even if it's just having a conversation with somebody, asking genuinely how they are, sitting down and praying with them, whatever it is, it's all contributing. It might fill you with horror if you were going to be doing this bit up here, or try and make the IT work, or have no capability to sing or play the piano, or they should all be singing, yeah? But there's always something we can do, and always something we can do to build each other up and encourage each other. So now, just think beyond a family service, about church life. What else goes on? There's all sorts of things that need to go on. And it's not just elders and trustees, children's work, youth work, safeguarding, if I dare mention. Midweek at two, coffee and ones, and all these different things. Yes, they're activities, they're things that need to be done. But again, all of us can contribute. The last thing I want to say about this is, for myself, Andy, Jeff, as elders, we've been thinking about this on our, on our elders' meetings. And I'm not going to make any grand announcements, ask for volunteers or anything this morning. I just want you to know we're thinking about this, we're praying about this. If you go back into Act 6, you will see that in this food distribution and this serving of the church, the apostles, the leaders of the church, were getting dragged into this, which then meant they hadn't got the time for preaching the word and for teaching and for prayer. So as a church, we need to take on board everything that needs to be done, find our role and find how we can contribute. And that means we are thinking about maybe asking for a little bit of help. That's all I'm going to say, so be prepared. At some point, we may ask for a bit of help. With some of the things on the first one, the second one, or something I've missed. 
Because if we can share, we can then also grow and serve together and help those who have a particular role that God has gifted them to do to be able to concentrate on that role and maybe not get dragged into other things. Does that make sense? But we're thinking about it. That's all I wanted to say. But isn't it, isn't it great? There's so many opportunities to serve and develop and grow in our little church. So, I've repeated the slide next. All of us come, but I've underlined as each part does its own special work. It's as we all contribute, it's as we all are humble enough to serve and be served that our church will grow and become a happier, healthy place. Okay, I'm going to move on towards communion effectively now. But what's the key? You know I put this one up every time. What's the key? Or should I say, who is centre of this? Who is head? Who is our example? It's Jesus, isn't it? Jesus, we've read it, is the Son of Man who did not come to be served, but to serve. If today you go away thinking, well there it is, Morris has just told us to roll our sleeves up and get serving. That's maybe a good thing to take away, but that's not really what I want you to take away. Because if we just decide we're going to roll our sleeves up and try harder, we'll only exhaust ourselves and we won't get it right. We need to have Christ as centre. We need to be transformed through the Holy Spirit and work in the Holy Spirit's power because ultimately, serving itself is worship, Romans 12 says. Our serving is an act of worship. It is Christ, the Grand Hendrick song says, that we are serving. So it's not just about trying harder, although we need to have the desire and make an effort. It's about submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to our head, Jesus Christ, and loving him. Because where I want to come on to really with communion is, if we love Jesus more and appreciate Jesus more and have a bigger vision of who he is, I don't think we'll find it so difficult to humbly serve each other and accept being served. Ultimately, it's about him. So, let's move on. So, I've done that one, Tom, because Christ is the centre. So, we're not going to do communion in the next five minutes. We might do communion in the next 10 or 15 minutes. I want to lead us in. Okay? So, we're not just going to jump. Come back to the verse we started with. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. For some of you, that may be a very, very familiar verse. For some of you, it may be a verse that you've only heard once or twice. But it's a beautiful verse. It's a good news gospel verse. It's a communion verse. It tells us about our Saviour who loved us so much to humble himself, to die on the cross, so that he could provide a ransom for us, so we could be forgiven, and brought back to a rightful relationship with God. In John chapter 12, Jesus talks about the Son of Man being lifted up and drawing all men to himself. And the crowds say, who is this Son of Man? Who is this Son of Man? If you read through the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself as Son of Man more, a lot more than anything else. And although this is, I just want to touch on this Son of Man. We think of Son of Man as being his humanity, and we think of Son of God as being his divinity. Just want to explore that a little bit so we can really get the impact of this verse. So what is Son of Man? I'm going to take a little trip now through a few Bible verses. Numbers says, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man, that's how a traditional translation will put it. The NIV says human being. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man, a human being, that he should change his mind. Now that's obvious, isn't it? God is not a human being. God is spirit. God is the eternal one. Ezekiel. Now, have you read Ezekiel? It's a bit of a hard read sometimes and difficult to understand. But don't let that put you off. We should try and read through everything in the Bible. But Ezekiel is referred to in the book that bears his name nearly a hundred times as son of man. The NIV uses human being. That's what the word means. It simply means human being. 
And God addresses Ezekiel and he says, So man, the IV will read it human being. Human. So, so man is a title that bears humanity. But is all Jesus is saying that I, the human, a human, came to serve? It, verse doesn't really particularly make sense if we just consider it as Jesus' humanity. Because he didn't become human until he was conceived and born. So how did the human come? He wasn't a human before. When he came, it was God coming. So let's look back. Daniel. Now we did a Bible study on Daniel, and I understand why we did it. Most of us, perhaps, know a little bit about the stories of Daniel, Daniel and the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. Oh, what terrific stories of faith. And that's the first six chapters. Then you get to chapter seven, and you go, well, this is hard. <laughs> now we did the Bible study in chapters one to six. That doesn't mean we shouldn't Again, it, we shouldn't ignore 7 to 12. This is Daniel 7. I'm just going to read it, and it's got a wonderful title of God, the Ancient of Days. Daniel, in this vision, he says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days sort of took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Now whether you've read the Bible or studied it a lot or been in church and taught a lot or whether you're quite new to this, you will recognise effectively that is a future scene of judgment set. The ancients of days sits as judge. It's very much like Revelation 1. And although it's not my main purpose today, I can't read that without pointing out, think seriously, that is a future event that is real. The Ancient of Days will sit. The Ancient of Days will judge. The books will be opened. And if you're standing there thinking you'll defend yourself, you will be silent. You will have no reasonable excuse, the books will be opened, you will be judged. It's solemn. But there's another book. There's the Lamb's Book of Life where everyone who comes in repentance and faith to Jesus find their name written forever. And we touched on the advocate, if you were here last time I spoke, the Holy Spirit is an advocate. Jesus Christ, the advocate, the righteous one. If we're in him, cleansed by his precious blood, not guilty, in clothed and dressed in his righteousness. Whatever way we have to give account, and the Bible makes it fairly clear we still will, but we will are forgiven. We are his children. We will not face judgment. But think solemnly about a passage like that, although that's not my main purpose for reading it. It carries on. So the ancient of days sits. That's the scene. And, and the vision continues. In my vision at night I looked, and there was before me one like a son of man. Some translations put the son of man, I'll come to that. But one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He, this son of man, was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now remember, this Hebrew word son of man effectively means human. What a passage. Daniel sees one, a human being. One of us. He approaches the ancient of days. But who is this son of man? Doesn't it sound, as you read it, rather like the Son of God? Doesn't it sound rather like the Son of David who will rule and his kingdom will last forever and ever and ever? He's worshipped. He must be God. Isn't it mind-boggling? We're only just unwrapping this a little tiny bit. Which is why some translations then put the Son of Man, because the inference is obvious in one sense. 
This Son of Man approached in the ancient of days who will have the kingdom is none other than Jesus Christ. It is the Son of God. That is who this Son of Man is. I'm going to read you something about Jesus' trial. Jesus is on trial, of course, fully innocent, wrongly accused. And as they're questioning him, and I'll only break into the middle of this, Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? What does Jesus say? I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Does that sound rather like Daniel 7? This one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds to reign. This is dynamite. This is earthquake tremors to the Jewish leaders and how they thought of the coming Messiah. Isn't it amazing? One of us, a human being, because Jesus is fully God and fully man. He has become fully human. As a human and as God, he will approach the ancient of days. He will sit and he will reign and his kingdom will be forever and ever. He will come on the clouds. They knew what he meant. They had a simple choice after Jesus replied. To bow down and worship or to say blasphemy. And we know what they chose. Effectively, we have the same choice. So, I'm going to come back to that verse. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Hopefully, you grasp something. That verse, it explodes. It isn't just that Jesus is serving as a human, he came as a human to serve, but he's the Son of God. This title, Son of Man, is as much about his humanity as it is about his divinity. Jesus is completely human and completely divine. Graham Hendrick put it in our first hymn, Meekness and majesty, manhood and deity in perfect harmony. The man who is God. This is the one who we're going to remember. This is the one who we worship. And I think that verse becomes so much more wonderful and meaningful and precious when you think of it as completely human, completely divine. I'm conscious of time. I am going to touch on my next Bible passages and I said I wanted to lead in slowly, but I'm not going to be able to read through them all. Meekness and majesty mentions washing of feet. We could have done the whole service on John 13. But to point out in John 13, just the yellow bit, Jesus is going to wash their feet. But John, through the Holy Spirit, says, Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave his world and go to the Father. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. There's the divinity. Some of us are not very comfortable in our own skin. Some of us are not very sure who we are. And we need to find the identity that God has given us more perfectly who we really are in Christ. Let me just say this. Jesus was not uncomfortable in his own skin. Jesus knew who he was. But because he knew who he was, so he got up. Therefore, Jesus knowing fully, fully God, fully human, because this is the time, this is the reason now he should give them the example of feet washing. And if you go on to the next bit, you know what happens next. Jesus takes the towel, he washes their feet. Humility to serve is what Jesus is showing and teaching them the humility to be served. We often criticise Peter. I think I'm with Peter on this one. Lord, you are not going to do that. Are we going to let Jesus wash our feet? We need to. He's the Son of God. He's our Saviour. He's the one we worship. But he's the one doing the washing. Peter says, no. That would be my instant reaction. No, I'm going to wash yours. <laughs> but Jesus is washing their feet. 
And what's this it's after it's giving to them? You should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, blessed will you be if you do them. So I come back to it. The key of today is a bigger appreciation of who Jesus is. Fully human, fully divine, the one who humbly came and served. And we are to take that serving to be like Christ of each other in humility. So as we go into communion now, I'm going to read one more passage carefully, slowly. And then I'm pretty much not going to say anything else. We'll share the bread and the wine and we'll listen to a song just to close, to contemplate. This sits, Philippians 2, very much in the same ilk. We notice Jesus fully God. We notice Jesus as a servant in humility. And it says we are to have the same mindset humbly to serve and to be served. Let's read it through, then we'll break the bread together. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every term of knowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we'll pray and we'll share communion with each other and with our Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace, for your love. We pray that your Holy Spirit will have opened up our hearts and minds to something about the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who will reign forever and ever. He is the one who will come on the clouds. He is the one who will reign in righteousness and set everything right. He is the one who will judge. And yet, as he is at your right hand now, in your presence, advocating for us, making representation for us on our behalf. Yes, Lord Jesus, you are there as the Son of God, divine as Paul says to the Colossian church, in you, Lord Jesus, God was pleased that all the fullness of God would grow. Yet you're there, and if we're able to see, we see nail-scarred hands, we see a spear-pierced side and nail-scarred feet. And Lord Jesus, we know that you are fully human still. You have taken our humanity to the heights of the throne. And as a new humanity, you will raise us up to be with you in resurrection, power, in eternal life. Oh Lord Jesus, how thankful we are. And it's all because of your love, your grace and your humility that you came to serve and to give your life a ransom for many. And so now as we take this bread together, Lord Jesus, we want to worship you, we want to give our thanks, we want to remember your death for us on the cross, that body that was pierced and broken, the Lamb of God who came and took away the sin of the world, the one who was our sacrifice, Lord Jesus, that you died in our place and took our debt. We just want to express our deepest gratitude and repent and confess the times we have just taken you for granted. Lord Jesus, we want to humbly bow and worship because you are our God, our Saviour and our Lord. Bless us now, we pray, as we seek to bless you together. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord Jesus, we thank you again for your sacrifice, the forgiveness that we have been granted through your precious blood, the blood that you shed that cleanses us from all our sin. What a thing it is that you have made us righteous, that you have made us free and forgiven, that you have restored us back to our Heavenly Father. Lord Jesus, again, we just want to say thank you. We only love you because you loved us with such a great love. Even while we were turning our backs, wandering away, deliberately ignoring every offer of grace that you were providing. We thank you for bringing us to the point of belief, of faith, of trust. That we have been washed clean in your precious blood by your sacrifice. So now as we take this wine together that so symbolises the depth of your mercy and grace and the extent of your love and the pain that you went through, <coughs> the despising, the shame. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We worship you. And we bless you until we see you in that glory all of the flaming fires and everything that we can't understand. Your glory, your beauty, your majesty to behold forever and ever. Lord Jesus, we thank you in your wonderful name. Amen. Merciful pursuit to 
God forever. 